Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight. Um, for those of you that are joining us for the first time, we request that you just place yourselves on mute. This is going to be a recorded session, a live recorded session. So we just request that everybody just place themselves on mute for now. So that way we can actually eventually use this to stream at other platforms. So if you can place yourself on mute, it will be greatly appreciated. We're going to give it to about 5.05 .05 and then we'll start the program. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight. My name is Rafael Roman. I'm one of your hosts for tonight and coach the Technician Executive Committee We're going to, for the NYC SHP. Um, but we're going to be starting the program off in just a little bit. One of the housekeeping rules that we're requesting from our pharmacy technicians and those who are attending today's session is just to place yourselves on mute so that way we can get things started. This is actually going to be a recorded live event. So if you can please place yourself on mute, it would be greatly appreciated. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. How are you? My name is Rafael Roman, current chair of the Pharmacy Technician and Executive Committee for NYC SHP and one of the co-chairs for tonight's event. I'm joined tonight by an amount of, of fantastic speakers that are joining us to provide us with the, the Pharmacy Technician Certification Board Examination Review. Tonight is an amazing event. Why? only because that we have a skew of pharmacists and pharmacy technicians that are helping us tonight to help empower other pharmacy technicians to actually pass the pharmacy technician certification exam or the PTCE. This is a momentous event because of the fact that it's not just powered by one particular organization, but multiple organizations across the city of New York. And for that, I wanna thank everybody who is participating for tonight and those of who are joining us tonight. I'm very thankful tonight for tonight's my co-chair and my director at large, Dr. Matthew Lee, who has always empowered our pharmacy technician programming here at NYC SHP. And tonight we're gonna to get the program started. Keep in mind, today's program is completely 100% free. There is no CE accredited to any pharmacy technician that's actually attending tonight's event, but tonight's event is about learning in order to empower you to actually pass the PTCE. Mm. We encourage the fact that everybody, to the best of their ability, ask questions at the very end, because tonight we have a lot of, of, of extreme amount of, of material to go over. So with that said, we're gonna go over the reason why we're here tonight. Tonight's reason and the general requirement that we currently have right now to become a pharmacy, pharmacy technician in the state of New York has eventually became, become a title of registered pharmacy technician within the New York State Requirement Legislature. 
to be licensed and registered as a pharmacy technician at the New York State Board for the New York State, you must be of good moral stand character, be at least 18 years of age, have completed high school or its equivalency as determined by the New York State Board of Education and have some type of certification from a national accredited organization for pharmacy technician certification programs acceptable to the department. So that means either being PTCB, which is one way to be certified through the state of New York, or two, NHA, the National Health Association, to be certified. The specific requirements for licensure are contained by Title VIII, Article 137A, Section 6844 uh, of New York State Education Law, Part 63 for the co commissioners of regular excuse me, commissioners of regulations. Now, who does this mainly affect? In terms of us, as far as being a statewide system, we're looking for this, this law affects pharmacy technicians that work in health, in health organizations. So if you work for a pharmacy or a compounding pharmacy, this law directly impacts you. If you're a pharmacy technician that happens to work in the retail setting, this will eventually impact you if you wish to explore outside the retail field. So for tonight, we encourage you to, uh, to at least engage on our platform tonight because this also will eventually affect you. If you would like to be a part of a national, uh, excuse me, if you would like to be a part of a health system pharmacy working for a major organization across the New York State, we encourage you to be pharmacy, PDCB or NHA certified. Now, in terms of the Pharmacy Technician Certification Board exam or the PTCE, the Pharmacy Technician Certification exam or PTCE is broken up to four knowledge domains. 40% of the exam is broken up into just medication knowledge. This is knowing both brand, generic, various other disciplines within that category. The next is federal requirements, which is 12.5%. The next, patient safety and quality assurance, which is 26.25%. And net last, which is order entry and processing, which is 21.25%. Now the PTCE exam is broken up into the following. There's 90 questions. Now, and of the 90 questions, 80, um, 80 of those questions will be scored. And the time allotted to every pharmacy technician is that for two hours, it's a two hour exam, but 10 minutes is devoted to pre-exam tutorial and post-question exams. So in general, it's about uh, an hour and 50, excuse me, it's about an hour and 50 minutes. So with that said, excuse me for a moment, as I advance the slides, we're gonna be focusing on part one. Now keep in mind, tonight's programming is actually broken up by many different practitioners within the city of New York. We have practitioners from Long Island, upstate New York, and the New York City area that's actually empowering tonight's program. And right now, our first person that's gonna be, uh, going be lecturing for tonight is Adrian Chapman, a certified pharmacy technician for the New York Presbyterian Wild Cornell system which is going to go over part one of the 40% medication programming. Adrian, you have the floor. Thank you, Raf. Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome. Let me just turn on my video here. Okay. Uh, I've been a pharmacy tech for over 15 years. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get this started. You know, working in a hospital, a lot of people uh, have forgotten a lot about OTCs and supplements. So for the PTCB, you know, some of the questions presented on the practice test as well as the certification exam are about OTC or over-the-counter medications. Um, this is a review for people who've mainly been working in a hospital setting and for retail techs who just need a refresher about the type of items that may be asked about on the exam. So in this case, I've created a list of important definitions and categories that I think will help with review. So since we have a lot to cover, let's go ahead and get it started. Go to the next slide. Okay, so the first thing I want to go over for everybody is water-soluble vitamins, right? We see these all the time. What kind of vitamins are these? These are the type of vitamins that dissolve in the water in your body, okay? Excess tends to be excreted through waste, and a big example and a very common one that we always see are the B-complex vitamins, and individually, those vitamins are thiamine, B1, riboflavin, B2, 
niacin B3, pantothenic acid B5, pyridoxine B6, biotin B7, folate B9, and cyanocobalamin B12. Okay, ascorbic acid, vitamin C, is also a water-soluble vitamin. And that just basically means these are excreted through, your, through waste, mainly urine, right? Okay, so that's that list. And I'm sure you guys have seen B vitamins and ascorbic acid a lot. Usually they put them together in a supplement as B complex with vitamin C, All right? The next thing I'm gonna go over really quickly is fat-soluble vitamins, okay? So this is a different category. And unlike water-soluble vitamins, these vitamins, they dissolve in the bloodstream, okay? And they're usually consumed in high fat meats and food items. Okay, so here's a few examples. Retinol, which is vitamin A. Ergocalciferol, vitamin D. You guys have seen this before, 50,000 units. Um, tocopherol, vitamin E. And then vitamin K, which is phytonadione. That one always trips me up. <laughs> okay, all right, okay. And so another, another category that we see a lot in OTCs and supplements is uh, allergy medication, right? We usually see these during this time of the year to treat seasonal, seasonal allergies like rhinitis and such, itchy eyes. Um, you mostly get them in tablet and capsule form, all right? There are a few exceptions, but I'm going to list the most common ones we see. And of course, there's fexafenidine, Allegra, that used to not be over-the-counter, right? Diphenhydramine, Benadryl, we've seen Benadryl, we've all used Benadryl at some point in our life. Uh, cetirizine, which is Zyrtec, uh, Loratadine, which is Claritin, and sometimes you see this in combination, Sudafedrin with Claritin, okay? Um, these are some of the common ones, right? And, I'm, and I have to go to the next page because there's so many, right? Uh, we mainly see Nasonex for, for our flu um, for nasal spray, okay? And then for the eyes, uh, I'm gonna try to tr get through this without tripping over it. Olapatidine, hydrochloride ophthalmic solution, nailed it. 0.2%, that's patidae. That used to be uh, non-over-the-counter. And just a little quick story about that. I remember there was one time I was in Rite Aid and during this time of the year, this is like gold, okay? Patidae was like gold. None of the stores had it in the region, but I made sure to always tell my pharmacist, order more before the allergy season. And he thanks me to this day for doing so because we're the only store in the region that had it. So patidae and Zyatoy, it's great that they're over the counter now and people can get them uh, whenever they need them, okay? So I'm gonna go on to supplements really quickly. Um, these are usually uh, recommended in conjunction with high blood pre pressure medication, cholesterol, diet medications, so on and so forth. And um, they're not vitamins, but they are supplements that we use all the same. So you might've seen omega-3 or omega-369, okay? We commonly see it as Lovaza, right? Um, they usually use this for cholesterol and diet health. Um, to use things that are non like habit forming, like Ambien, Sometimes they recommend melatonin, which is a sleep aid, okay? We might've seen cranberry supplements like Azo and other, other name brand supplements for urinary tract health and pain relief associated with period cramps and UTI infections, right? There's St. John's wort that's sometimes recommended for stress relief, mental wellness, you know, to calm you down and the calming effect. And then there's saw palmetto, which is recommended for men. And you find in a lot of multivitamins for men uh, specifically because it's for prostate health, okay? We also have milk thistle, which is for liver health, okay? And then when it comes to your stomach and gut health, we have CoQ Enzyme 10. And we also have Floristore slash Acidophilus. These are both uh, promote healthy flora and gut health. These are like healthy cultures that go, that you can um, get in food and also in your yogurt, but they have it in capsule and pill form for people who would rather take it that way, okay? All right, so now we're gonna move on to topical creams and topicals. Um, used for dermatitis, allergies, as well as antibiotic and antifungal treatments. Here's a few of the most common ones we see in both retail and a hospital setting, okay? So there's diphenhydramine cream or Benadryl cream, you know, for itching and relief associated with al allergic reactions like hives and contact dermatitis, maybe touch some poison oak, you know, um, that's what they use that for to calm that down. We also see hydrocortisone cream. Uh, we see that a lot in retail and in the hospital setting, right? Both in cream and ointment form as used for allergies, eczema, dermatitis and itching, redness, and relief associated with these conditions, okay? We also have the antifungal clotrimazole cream or Lotrimin AF, and we use it for relief for athlete's foot, ringworm, thrush, and for fungal nails, okay? Um, we have the triple antibiotic ointment, neo neosporin, 
which is used for minor cuts and scrapes, and it's supposed to help you prevent having bacterial infections and help with healing. Okay. Now, for pain management, okay, because we see these in OTCs a lot too, um, this class of medications is used to treat a wide range of aches and pains, as well as used in conjunction with other pain regimens. We often you you often see these in retail. They're usually prescribed uh, for breakthrough pain when people are taking other things like Norco or uh, Percocet or oxycodone. Um, these can help with recovery and functioning for everyday activities, especially if you're like a weekend warrior, right? So mm -hmm. there's Tylenol, which we all see all the time, right? So it's used for issues big and small. This is used for all sorts of aches and pains as well as fever. Okay, we have aspirin, and you might have seen it as Bayer. Sometimes you hear it called Echotrin. Sometimes it's referred to as baby aspirin, uh, but it's anything but, right? This is a major player when it comes to heart health, and it's used with a lot of non-OTC medications to help with, uh, like I said, heart health, blood thinning, headaches, fever, et cetera. You know, but this one is special be because it belongs to the pain medications known as NSAIDs, okay? Mm. And we're gonna jump to the next one, which is NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, right? We hear about these all the time, especially when we're training as pharmacy techs, because it's very important to know the difference between this versus Tylenol, right? And these drugs are used mostly to manage pain associated with arthritis, gout and other forms of joint pain and discomfort. Um, it's important that we always let people know that while they are extremely effective, they can lead and cause ulcers if you do not take them with food. So it's ultimately important that people take them with food whenever they take these products, right? And with that said, here's a few of them. We all know Advil, or ibuprofen, okay? It's used kind of similarly to the way we use Tylenol, but it's used for other pains as well, such as cramps and period pain, joint pain, so on and so forth. And naproxen, specifically Aleve, is used mainly for joint pain and arthritis, okay, and sometimes for gout. Okay, so the unsunny side of this, right, adverse effects that we have to think about when we talk about uh, OTC uh, medications and supplements, okay, is um, while a lot of the medications are highly compatible, right, non-OTC non medications, there should be care taken when you're administrating and uh, spacing these medications. And when patients get counseled about certain antibiotics or other non-OTC medications they're taking, this should be explained to them as one of the side effects, right? Supplements with calcium, for instance, can affect the absorption of antibiotics, you know, like and also Synthroid or Levothyroxine and various blood pressure medication. Um, magnesium and aluminum, which are supplements we find in a lot of multivitamins and also separately, can cause issues with digoxin absorption. You know, that's a high alert medication. It's very, very uh, important that we take that into consideration, okay? Aspirin in conjunction with warfarin can cause abnormal um, bleeding. You know, obviously aspirin is a blood thinner and so is warfarin. So we don't wanna have them working at the same time or spaced or monitored closely by whichever doctor you're consulting. Allergy medications like diphenhydramine, they can cause drowsiness and while it does relieve your allergy symptoms, a non-drowsy alternative like cetirizine, Zyrtec, or phenethexidine, Allegra, should be recommended if you're not able to function safely while taking this medication. So if you have to work and you're going to be nodding off, obviously, you should be taking something like loratadine or something like Zyrtec or even Allegra, right? Lastly, it should be mentioned that some of these medications can be absorbed in breast milk and should be considered when a patient is pregnant or nursing, right? NSAIDs are not also not recommended in the last trimester of pregnancy as it can have unforeseen effects on the fetus and its development, as well as cause complication with delivery. So just like all the other medications, NSAIDs are, you know, you gotta be very careful with those. So in conclusion for this part of the, the review, um, there are plenty of other OTC medications and supplements that I didn't mention, right? However, there are, these are some of the most common medications and uses and side effects we see when we use these supplements and vitamins in both hospitals and retail settings. Okay, so when you're working in retail and Rite Aid, CVS, wherever you're at, usually they have them on display right in front of the pharmacy. There's usually a few rows. You always see them there at the window, right? So it's a good practice if you just look at all the supplements in front of the pharmacy and usually on the pharmacy aisle and just get used to them and familiar with their uses. For us in the, for the techs that are now working in the hospital setting, while we don't see some of these supplements all the time, take note when you see things like B-complex and the different B-complex components or vitamin C, and different, uh, you know, OTC items you may see and uh, that we don't really pay attention to until now when we're doing these reviews, right? You realize that you probably know more about these than you than you actually think you do. Yeah. Um, I hope this helps, and um, thank you. Good luck with your study and good luck with your test. Very good. 
Thank you so much, Adrian. I really do appreciate that because it's been a long time since I've had some exposure to over-the-counter medications. And quite frankly, I barely remember that from my CP, excuse me, my PDCE. Um, so we thank you for that segment. Adrian Chapman, ladies and gentlemen, we really do appreciate him for participating for tonight's event. And next we're gonna switch gears to actually bring it to my amazing director at large, the fantastic Dr. Matthew Lee, who is gonna take over discussing medications part two that are outside the farm, the over-the-counter products. So Matt, you have the floor. Uh, my name is Matthew Lee. I'm a critical care pharmacist. And uh, the medications two section is pretty brief uh, when you take away the indications portion. Um, so let's just jump right into it. Um, so we're gonna talk about some drugs with narrow, narrow therapeutic indices. We're gonna talk about some storage considerations and then the rest of the presentation is just slides, mostly for self-study, but I'll just click through them so everyone knows what's encompassed in this and uh, what are some things you could possibly expect. So when we talk about drugs with narrow therapeutic indices, what we're really saying is the drug has a very narrow therapeutic window where too little, you don't get a good effect and too much, you get a toxic effect. So with these medications, you really want to find a balance. And these are things that pharmacists, the, the pharmacists that you're working with will treat a little bit more seriously. <clears throat> so this table essentially highlights all the drugs that have, or not all, but a majority of the drugs that we commonly encounter that have narrow therapeutic indices. And I group them based on indications in general. So you notice the first row, you see a lot of anti-epileptics that also could be used, some of them as for mood disorders. Um, so these are all drugs that one way or another, we monitor very carefully, whether it's the weekly blood test, like with clozapine, or it's with serum levels, um, such as like a lithium level, a valpro level, phenobarb level, et cetera. Digoxin's another common one. Our anticoagulants, specifically warfarin and heparin, these are drugs where we'll be monitoring very closely, whether it's the INR with warfarin or APTTs with heparin. Um, drugs like methotrexate can be either used for various oncologic indications, as well as for rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, levothyroxine, uh, thyroid hormone replacement actually does have a very narrow therapeutic index, meaning that in, for this medication, we typically don't increase the dose very rapidly. So if a patient's on, let's say, 25 mice, we would never jump to 150 the next day. This is something that comes slow and steady because the drug lasts for a long time. It takes a long time to get the therapeutic effect. Antibiotics like vancomycin and aminoglycoside, same thing. You'll commonly hear things like oh, check a vancomycin level or an uh, amino glycoside trough or peak. So these are things that we monitor very carefully. And then you have antifungals like amphotericin, which have very severe side effect profiles, so we have to be careful. Antiarrhythmics like amiodarone and theophylin, which doesn't see too much use nowadays, but it does have its certain niche. So we do try to keep a careful eye on that. Moving on to storage. So I wanted to highlight just the three main storage options we mainly encounter in the pharmacy world. And that's room temperature, the refrigerator, and the freezer. Uh, so the main purpose of this is to really ensure that the, medic the storage conditions are optimal because any changes can actually be very detrimental to the drug itself. So some drugs are actually not compatible very long out of their recommended storage, whether it's the fridge or the freezer. And any deviation can actually lead to precipitation, decomposition, or in some cases, combustion. So we really want to be careful and pay careful attention to what the recommended uh, standard operating procedures are, as well as what's recommended in the package insert. Other things that you want to keep an eye out for, especially in daily practice, is uh, light and moisture sensitivity. So for those in the outpatient setting or for those who do unit dose, you know that drugs like Prodaxa, we don't like to open because it decreases the shelf life immediately. And a lot of drugs you'll commonly see packaged in uh, light sensitive bags, so amber bags, uh, to prevent uh, light degradation. So these are all things we have to pay attention to because if you encounter a drug that is light sensitive and hasn't been protected, that drug should be considered to be um, unusable for the patient. This part is probably one of the most confusing parts of the examination and in general. Um, the concept of beyond use dating. So the main difference between a beyond use date and an expiration date is beyond use date refers to compounded drugs, whereas expiration date refers to manufactured drugs. So in an institution, majority of cases, it's gonna be compounded medications, patient specific, and that should adhere to 
um, criteria based on the risk level of the product. And this table here sort of highlights the three main risk categories you'll encounter. And a lot of things will go into determining what the risk of the product is, whether it's a combination of the environment it was made, whether it's a sterile environment or at the bedside. In addition, also considerations such as the number of manipulations, such as how many times do you go in and out of a vial, how many times do you go in and out of a bag, uh, and are those products sterile or not? So all those things go into it, and then you finally get recommendations on the uh, storage conditions and the beyond use dating. Now, I will preface that although these are the recommended recommendations from ASHP sterile compounding guidelines, institutions do vary based on their capabilities. So for example, if you work in an institution in which the, the clean room can only support a 12 hour beyond use date, uh, even for let's say low risk products, you have to refer to the more stringent one. But these are the general recommendations straight from the ASHP guidelines. And you'll see based on the risk, the lower risk it is, the more stable it is at room temperature. Whereas the higher the risk, the less stable it is. Um, but again, always refer to institute specific for the purposes of the examination. This is the ASHP recommendations on the beyond use dating. I also wanted to touch upon some drug interactions. Um, so for the examination, just so some very common drug interactions that are encountered in your clinical practice. Um, so most commonly, you'll know about the statin medications. Now, these are cholesterol lowering medications such as atorvastatin, simvastatin, rosuvastatin, et cetera. And they have an interaction with grapefruit juice because grapefruit juice has some compounds in it, the furanic humorants, and they decrease that metabolism. So you have increased drug concentration and increased risk for adverse events. In addition, uh, you have a lot of drugs such as antibiotics like the tetracyclines, the fluoroquinolones, the thyroid hormone levothyroxine, and the bisphosphonates like alendronate. Those drugs tend to chelate or bind to uh, cations. And that's just a fancy term for um, mole molecules that have a positive charge. And that's also fancy, but basically it just means like things like calcium, which is Ca2+, magnesium, Mg2+, iron. These are all things that with that positive charge, they like to bind to these drugs. So what does that mean? We want to space them out. And usually if it's oral and it has an interaction, the general recommendation is space it out by at least an hour before and an hour after. Some drugs may require two hours before, two hours after, but minimum an hour, and you want to separate as much as possible because they tend to bind. Drugs like nitrates, uh, so those are things like nitroglycerin and um, the phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors, such as uh, Viagra, Cialis, they both can drop the blood pressure very quickly and very rapidly. So there's an increased risk for severe hypotension. Drugs like the ACE inhibitors or the angiotensin receptor blockers like Losartan, Lisinopril, et cetera, they tend to increase potassium. So when you're given these drugs in combination with potassium supplements like your potassium chloride riders, et cetera, the risk for hyperkalemia shoots up. So you really want to monitor that carefully. And lastly, um, QTC prolongation is this huge thing. And I will say that this is probably one of the most overrided alerts in the EMR where you get alert fatigue, you just override it. Uh, but certain drugs like the antibiotics like macrolides, so that's like your azithromycin, um, and also amiodarone, your antidepressants like Lexapro, fluoxetine, fluoroquinolones, um, quinine, which doesn't get so much use in the antipsychotics, they all can increase the QT interval. Now, that's just basically on the EKG, there's an interval, it's called a QT interval. These drugs, if they prolong the time of the interval, there's an increased chance for fatal arrhythmias known as torsades. Torsades can lead to fatal arrhythmias like ventricular fibrillation and then sudden cardiac death. So no good. Uh, you just want to make sure that when you see multiple uh, agents that can prolong QTC the QTC interval, you want to make sure that they're each indicated and that the team is aware, the pharmacist is aware that this interaction exists and every single medication is absolutely necessary. The risks and benefits were discussed. So that's most of the things I wanted to go over, but here I'm gonna show you um, the common indications and the slide deck will be sent out later along with the recording. So this will be available for reference. Um, this is basically going in order of the major categories. So at first here, you'll see anti-epileptics and the majority of these tables were all adapted from this great resource for pharmacy technician recertification through ASHP. Um, so we have an anti-epileptics here. Again, for the sake of the presentation, I'm not going to go over this. I'm just going to show you what we have. Uh, our Parkinsonian drugs. 
Uh, we have our agents for Alzheimer's, uh, drugs for multiple sclerosis, common drugs used for headaches, headaches continued, uh, neuropathic pain, antidepressants, and these are classified based on their category, uh, bipolar agents, drugs used for anxiety disorders, antipsychotics, sedatives and hypnotics, drugs used for ADHD, cholesterol lowering medications, diuretics, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers combinations, calcium channel blockers, antiarrhythmics, drugs used for asthma and COPD, additional drugs used for asthma and COPD. We have our corticosteroids. You have your antihistamines, drugs used for osteoporosis, uh, your NSAIDs, muscle relaxants, opioids, insulins, anti-diabetic agents, thyroid hormone replacement therapy, your histamine receptor blockers, your proton pump inhibitors. These are your antiemetics, laxatives, topical corticosteroids, drugs used for BPH, uh, your cephalosporin antibiotics, your fluoroquinolone antibiotics, uh, macrolide antibiotics, penicillins, antifungals, vaccines, anticoagulants. So again, these will be for your reference, uh, for your own uh, study time to just look at the drugs, the class and the common indications that's used for. Um, with that, I'll pass it on to our next section. Uh, Rafael, I'm just gonna pass host code control to you so people could remote control you in one sec. Excellent. And thank you so much, Matt, for actually explaining this section. I know, for many of you, you're like, whoa, you went through this pretty quickly. But a great majority of this section is memorization and going through it one by one. I promise you, at the end of this lecture, we're going to provide these resources for all pharmacy technicians that are uh, participating for tonight. So please do not panic when it comes to this. Mm -hmm. um, these resources will be readily available to you post tonight. Matt, thank you so much for tonight. Um, like I said, just stated previously, Matt is my director at large for the NYC SHP. Um, he is an amazing supporter of the pharmacy technician profession um, and has been encouraging me as a pharmacy technician for the New York State. Um, I practice currently at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center as their training coordinator and technical operations for their, for their pharmacy department. Um, Matt has been fantastic in supporting us as a profession. And we thank him for tonight and we thank you for your lecture. Um, with that said, let me share my screen so we can go over the next portion. Um, my portion, I will not lie, is the one portion of the pharmacy technician, um, the PTCE that I, I won't lie, when I first took this portion of the exam, I was not the most proficient, but now being a, an experienced pharmacy technician that has been practicing in the state of New York for over, I'm not gonna say how many years, plus years, but we'll just leave it at 15 plus years, um, is uh, very, very much um, uh, very experienced in terms of this. So let me share my screen real quick. Um, Matt, can you just um, transfer me host privileges, please? Uh, I believe I did. Let me just double check here somehow. So uh, you are host. Um, you're logged in twice, so maybe double check it's not the other screen. You can just delegate uh. yourself to the other. Sure, hold on one moment. Technical difficulties, ladies and gentlemen, so sorry. Um, uh, 
Yeah, I'll reclaim host and I'll, I'll make the other account. Okay, cool. Oh, got it. Cool. Perfection. Thank you so much, Matt, for tonight. And thank you so much for your lecture. It was my pleasure. All right, just to make sure everything is pulled up. All righty. So ladies and gentlemen, tonight I have the wonder and the privilege of talking about federal requirement, which counts for 12.25% of the PTCE. Now, yes, I understand 12.25% comparatively to the rest of the actual exam is relatively low. But at the same time, federal requirements and federal law is extremely essential when it comes to us as a daily practice. So granted, we're being tested on this at this practice for with the PTCE. It is very essential for us as pharmacy technicians to understand, comprehend, and apply this to our day-to-day -day practice. So just to go over what we're going to be reviewing today, we'll be focusing on all five disciplines of the federal requirement review. So sections 2.1, which is the federal requirements for handling and disposal of non-hazardous, hazardous, and pharmaceutical substance and waste. Sections 2.2, which is federal requirements for controlled substances, prescriptions, particularly when it comes to news, uh, new prescriptions, refills, and transfers, and DEA, so, uh, controlled substance and schedules. We'll also be reviewing 2.3, federal requirements, DEA and FDA, particular, uh, in particular for controlled substances when it comes to receiving, storing, ordering, labeling, reverse distribution and take back programs and loss or theft of any of these substances. Federal requirements, which is section 2.4, federal requirements of restricted drug programs and related medication processing, and particularly when it comes to pseudoephedrine and risk evaluation and mit uh, mitigation strategies, REMS programs in particular. And last but not least, and hopefully I don't put you all to sleep when it comes to this lecture, granted we have two major sections coming up, which is section 2.5, which is FDA recall requirements when it comes to medications, devices, supplies, supplements, and classifications. So the first section that we're gonna be going over is safe handling disposal when it comes to focus areas, when it comes to hazardous materials, non-hazardous materials, pharmaceutical substances, and controlled substances. So the first thing we're gonna be talking about is hazardous materials. Hazardous materials, excuse me, hazardous materials are chemical or drugs that possess potential harm for person particip persons participating or coming in contact with it. Now, many times people misconstrue these hazardous materials as just being chemo level drugs. Percent incorrect. Yes, chemo drugs are, account for a great majority of hazardous drugs but they are about 80% of what those hazardous drugs may be. The other 20% are drugs that are non-chemo related. Now, when it comes to regulatory bodies that actually organize and, mid and manage these, this particular section, we're gonna be talking about the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, which protects employees who work with hazardous materials. They require personal protective equipment or PPE, not just for pharmacy representatives, but for all medical professionals. That includes ensuring that there are safety standards when it comes to gloves, gowns, goggles, masks, hair covers, and et cetera, and procedures for dealing with different types of hazardous substances in terms of labeling drug substances into different categories. Hazardous drugs are broken up into two different three, excuse me, different classes. Hazardous drug class one, hazardous drug class two, and hazardous drug class three. And this may differ based on the institution that you practice for. Now, in terms of references, when it comes to hazardous drugs, there is one major Bible source when it comes to this reference, our SDS, our safety data sheets. SDSs are online uh, outline for appropriate handling storage requirements and cleanup procedures for the hazardous product. So how exactly do they de delineate this information? In terms of handling, it goes over hazardous materials and chemicals that should be stored separately from other materials. In terms of storage, explaining that materials stored in a negative pressure room, and let me just make sure that everybody's on the same page, 
When it comes to storage of materials, it can be one of three potential areas, negative pressure, positive pressure, and neutral pressure. When we say negative pressure, it's basically a vacuum inside a room. That way, in case of anything, if the drug were to, for instance, break inside the room, all those vapors and aerosols are trapped inside the room and vacuumed up to a central place. Versus positive pressure, which actually pressure is pushed outside the room and goes to the outside environment and can affect other people. Generally speaking, when it comes to hazardous drugs, we're working in negative pressured environments where the actual vapors are trapped within inside the room. And even when it comes to transporting drugs, there are specific regulations when it comes to this. So during transport, these types of drugs are stored in leak-proof containers and sealed during and labeled with hazardous drug waste. So in particular, when it comes to me who works in a cancer institution, the one thing we do after compounding a particular cancer drug or any type of hazardous drug as we compound the drug, label the drug, place it inside a sealed bag, which mm -hmm. is a clear plastic bag, mm -hmm. then place that sealed plastic bag, place that into an additional bag, mm -hmm. which is labeled hashes drug waste, danger, mm -hmm. danger, Will Robinson, be careful. So that way others are aware of the fact of the potential harms of handling with this drug. Now, it's the last thing we're gonna be discussing when it comes to hazardous drug materials is the cleanup procedures or accidental exposures when it comes to these type of drugs. Accidents happening. When it comes to us, whether working with hazardous drugs or non-hazardous drugs, we are all aware of the fact that accidents do happen. But we have to protect ourselves and those that we work with to ensure safety precautions. So the one thing we have to be very conscious of is the equipment that we have in front of us. So when we talk about equipment, we're talking about locations such as your eyewash station, in case the drug gets into your eye to flush your eye out. Showers, in case you have a full body exposure to actually douse yourself off with hot water or cold water in order to make sure the drug is wiped off of you. Sinks, are they are available to you so you can wash your hands for the aseptic compounding or non-aseptic compounding when it comes to exposure. The next thing is spill kits. When it comes to hazardous drugs and you have an accidental spill, Cleaning up the procedure is very different than spilling your, how can I put it, your spaghetti and meatballs on your cable. They vary vastly different. You have to be very, very careful of how you do this. So in doing such, spill kits are developed depending on the institution that allows you to actually clean up small spills and also procedures in place to clean up very larger spills that are unmanageable by the pharmacy department and normally taken under the advisement your environmental health services or your EHS department. Now keep in mind when it comes to these type of procedures, whether it be small spills or large spills, there is event reporting required when it comes to this. Now when it comes to event reporting, event reporting is actually differs based on two different principles. One, to ensure the fact of tracking when it comes to excessive or non or tracking of um, uh, 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 event spills, but two, to ensure the fact the safety of employees who are exposed to environmental drugs. So for instance, when it comes to event reporting, you're, you're reporting on the actual specific event itself, explaining the fact of what happened that there was a potential spill. The second set of reporting could also be reporting to your EHS, excuse me, or your employee health services, where you're reporting the fact that you were exposed to any particular hazardous drug in which case they'll may follow up with you for further testing and further compliance when it comes to health uh, uh, OSHA standards. Next thing we're gonna be talking about is non-hazardous materials, which are not too stringent comparably to hazardous materials, but when it comes to non-hazardous materials, they do not have the same level of attention as hazardous drugs, but they can have potential harm to the environment if not disposed of correctly, and particularly when it comes to P or U listed drugs. And I strongly encourage those who are listening to this right now to understand the principle between P and U listed drugs. Some drugs that fall into these categories can be something as, as simple as insulin or nitroglycerin products. These products cannot be something that you could just simply throw away in the garbage, but they have to be disposed of safely. Another category would be antibiotics. When it comes to antibiotics, you can't just simply flush them down the drain or flush them down the actual sink. 
Why? Because of environmental harms or the potential of super bugs or viruses. You have to handle these drugs particularly careful. The next thing we're going to be talking about is pharmaceutical substances. When it comes to pharmaceutical substance, it is the substance used for therapeutic treatment or medications or the ingredients used to make hazardous or non-hazardous materials. And their expired medications can be sent back to manufacturers for reverse distribution. Now, when it comes to pharmaceutical substances, the equipment disposal varies very, very differently than what you do with the normal retail-based pharmacy. Generally speaking, these requipments deal with vaccines, syringes, needles, which need to be disposed of in sharp containers. So please keep that in mind when it comes to the apparatuses used for certain pharmaceutical substances. The next thing we're gonna be talking about, which is gonna be a very much a great consumption of the slides I'm gonna be discussing. And once again, I hope I don't put you all to sleep about this. It's gonna be controlled substances. Controlled substances are medications that carry a high risk for abuse and misuse. Now the regulatory body that basically oversees this is the Drug Enforcement Agency or the DEA. Now, please, ladies and gentlemen, and those who are listening, please keep the DEA in mind because we're gonna be talking about them a lot within the next, I would say 20 minutes or so. When it comes to the DEA, story conditions are very, very specific in terms of allowing the fact that drugs that happen to be controlled substances be designated to specific areas, such as the vault or a locked cabinet, contain controlled medications or segregated, or segregated to maintain accurate, excuse me, accurate inventory, potential for diversion or unethical practices. Now, we also have to keep in mind when it comes to any type of controlled substance, whether it be coming to the pharmacy or outside the pharmacy, everything, and I mean everything, is being tracked. DEA regulates all movements and ensures that the process is traceable from proper handling and minimize any potential for diversion or unethical practices. This means going from manufacturer to pharmacy and then from pharmacy to patient. And we're gonna be talking about that at length. Now, when it comes to schedules of controlled substances, it can come in five different forms. The controlled substance one, controlled substance two, controlled substance three, four, and then five. When we talk about controlled substance ones, the abuse potential, meaning someone misusing these drugs are extremely high. They are not accepted for medicinal use in the United States. And some examples of these drugs could be heroin and or cocaine. The second is going to be C2s, which have a high potential of abuse. And this is mostly described as severe psych psychological and or physical dependence when it comes to these type of drugs. These are mostly described as drugs such as oxycodone or Adderall. The third or C2, C3 level drugs have mild potential for abuse and a risk or the risk for the, the dependency is there. Certain examples of a C3 medication could be ketamine or suboxone. And we're gonna be talking about suboxone very much in the next upcoming slides. There are C4s, which has the low potential for abuse and then could have the risks for dependency do vary and some examples of that will be our Perlizam or Zolpidine, which is like Ambien. Um, and last but not least, the C5 or C, um, drugs, which have minimal uh, potential for abuse. And the risk for dependency contains limited amounts of narcotics. This can be an example of codeine containing cough syrups. So for instance, Robitussin AC or pregabalin, such as Lyrica. Now, when filling these drugs, filling these drugs come with its own set of restrictions. And particularly when it comes to C2 medications, the filling restrictions are as follows. One prescribed by a doctor or any type of health system, uh, excuse me, um, uh, a health professional, that happens to be a doctor, nurse, or PA, or physician assistant, they can call in the prescription electronically. It can be handwritten on a secure prescription. Faxes only are acceptable only for hospice or long-term care. And when it comes to phone or verbal, we're allowed to obtain a prescription limited to 72 hours supply, depending on the jurisdiction. 
um, and it must be followed up by an electronic or hard copy. The expiration date of prescription is for state regulations typical within 90 days to about to the written uh, of the written date. And federal regulations do not suggest a specific time limit. When it comes to refills, there are no refills. No matter what state you are practicing in, there are no refills when it comes to C2 medications. Now, when it comes to partial fills, and this is something that is very common within the retail setting, and I'll explain this a little bit further. Partial fills are when a pharmacy system does not have the full amount of the drug in order to give the patient. So with that, a pharmacy, if a patient's insurance has specific quantity limits, or the patient doesn't want to fill the entire quantity, the remainder of the balance is forfeiting and cannot be refilled. Or if this is hospice, the patient or eligible not patient or eligible to partial partial fill in increments, and such prescriptions expire within sixty days from the written date. So essentially, if the pharmacy system doesn't have this particular C two medication in stock, a patient can receive either a certain amount for a particular amount of days, and then after that, they can't come back for it. Or if this is hospice, for instance, they can fill it partially and then come back within 60 days for the other portion of the actual drug. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to transfers, you can system to health system or pharmacy to pharmacy. So that means even if I have a farm SCVS that I'm working with over 20 miles away, I can't transfer this drug to another location. That is an absolute no-no and will not happen. Now, when it comes to C3s through C5s, the restrictions are very different. When it comes to those who are prescribed with a C3 through 5 medication, they can be, um, they can be called in via electronically, handwritten, faxed, or via phone. The expiration date of restriction is six months from the date of written and or a limit of 90 days supply max per mm -hmm. fill. In terms of refills, yes, they can be refilled but limited to a max of five refills of a six month period. In terms of transfers, yes, they can be transferred between pharmacies one time only, unless the pharmacies share an online real time database. Now keep in mind, take this all with a grain of salt because there's gonna be something that's gonna be thrown in here in the next upcoming slides that kind of negates this entire process for those of us who are practicing in the state of New York. So as an FYI, when filling control substances, refills in particular, control substances cannot be filled early. At most, one to two days may be acceptable. And this is at the discretion of the pharmacy system which you practice with. In terms of transfers, all transfers must be between two pharmacists, meaning it can't be between a pharmacist and a pharmacy student or pharmacy intern. It cannot be technician to technician or pharmacist to technician. It has to be between two pharmacists. After the transfer, the prescription should be voided by the original pharmacy after transfer and a notation that is being transfer prescribed prescription should be written by the current pharmacy. Meaning, if I am at one store located in Long Island, New York, and I decide to call in the transfer of a controlled substance to that happens to be C3 through C5 to a Manhattan uh, uh, pharmacy that's located there, I, as a pharmacy out in Long Island, have to void that prescription out. Now, when it comes to C3s through C5s, it's indicated by law for, pharma for the refill purposes only, not initial fills. So meaning, if I have a only, I'm only able to fill a C3 through C5 at my pharmacy out in Long Island, I cannot transfer that prescription out to another location. Why? because it's a brand new prescription. Had it been a refill, yes, I could. But because of the fact this is an initial film, absolutely not, I cannot do this process. In terms of information needed for transfers, in terms of the information that needs to be given to the recipient pharmacy, the original prescription date and dispensing date is needed, number of refills remaining on the, on the prescription itself, the name of the transferring pharmacist needs to be provided and the DEA name and address of the transferring pharmacy need to be documented on the prescription for auditing purposes for the DEA. Now, when it comes to receiving controlled substance shipments, it's not as simple as just receiving a drug and walking away. 
When it comes to controlled substances, particularly when it comes to C2s, the pharmacist on duty must verify each item on the document, the date of each was received on copy three of the original form that occupies the order and copy three of each order must be maintained in the pharmacy for at least two years. So just to give you all a little bit more of a background, I'm gonna to touch upon this in the next upcoming slides. There's basically a triplicate form that's given when it comes to C2 medications. There's form one, form two, and form three, or copy one, copy two, copy three. Copy three is the one, and please keep this in mind because the PTC asked this, what form do all pharmacy keep is going to be copy three. That is the copy in which you must keep on file for a minimum two years. Remember that three, copy three, two years, copy three, two years. Mm -hmm. Quick word of the wise, because that counts as a point on the actual exam itself. Now, when it comes to C3s or C4, um, C3s or C5s, there's no specific requirements, and we really don't need to go into the woodworks when it comes to that. C2s are the ones that we have to focus the majority of our attention on. When it comes to storage controlled substances, when it comes to C2s, it must be kept under lock and key in their own designated vault or cabinet. A vault or cabinet must be equipped with a proper locking mechanism in order to, in, or, in addition to having multiple cameras positioned on each, excuse me, multiple cameras positioned on, e, on it at all times. Meaning these control substances are never under lock and key are never under without a watchful eye. When it comes to C3, C3, C5s, dispense without a pharmacist, a pharmacy's non-controlled medication inventory or in its own designated lock vault. Cameras must be positioned on these medications as well, but not as stringent when it comes to the C2s. Mm -hmm. Ordering control substances are vastly different than ordering random drugs. So I apologize in advance with having to bombard you with this information, but I promise you it is essential for this exam. Mm -hmm. When it comes to ordering C2 medications, and must be ordered on a DEA 222 form. Once again, all C2 medications must be ordered on a DEA 222 form. This is essential. The DEA 222 form is specific to the Schedule II drugs and must be completed in triplicate and can be handwritten or typed. Now, when it comes to these triplicate forms, there's three different copies, and I alluded to this previously. The top copy is for the supplier. The middle copy is for the DEA itself. And the bottom copy is sent back to the purchaser. So it's actually sent back to the actual manufacturer so that way they know. The DEA 222 is valid for 60 days once filled out. And the max of 10 different drugs on one form is signed by the pharmacist who is registered with the DEA meaning no Joe Schmo can just randomly walk into your pharmacy and just order a random C2 drug. No, absolutely <coughs> not. They must have a DEA 222 form in, uh, you must be a part of your DEA of your pharmacy store in order to receive, to order these medications. Next thing we're gonna be talking about is a controlled substance ordering system or CSOS can be used to place a DEA 222 form from ordering C2 medications. The pharmacy must meet specific electronic requirements to ensure digital security while using the CSO2. Largely, um, largely replaced uh, paper for DEA 222 due to convenience and ease of use. So this is as recent as 2019 in terms of the system being in place. The DE has ruled in favor of a single copy of the DEA 222 form to replace previously triplicate forms. And the duplicate of the triplicate will be obsolete relatively soon. So within the next heck, within the next six months or so, we're going to be seeing that this triplicate form is going to be obsolete and CSOS are going to be the primary source when it comes to ordering C2 medications. So please keep this in mind when it comes to the actual process itself. Next thing we're gonna be talking about is alternative facts when it comes to medication control substances. So I know this is very confusing, but I'll try to explain this as best as I can. 
Part of filming controlled substances is developing an eye for un unethical practices. So quantity and day supply limitations is vital to know how to calculate a prescription day supply. So what does that mean? We, us as pharmacy technicians need to know when we look at prescription and a doctor place the maximum daily supply of a supplement uh, of a drug, know the fact that if they exceed the daily supply, that the prescription may be invalid. And in which case we have to open up the conversation to our pharmacists and let them know that, hey, FYI, there's a problem with this prescription. In terms of alterations, C2 medications when written on a prescription pad can never, and I mean never, be altered. Even if the doctor or the prescriber calls you and tells you they screwed up on something, it is not allowed. You need a physical copy of a different form in order for you to fill that prescription. Expiration dates are very key. And DEA verification, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, are extremely key. Now remember, pharmacies must follow both federal and state laws. In events, and this is where this is extremely key, and many of you who practice in the state of New York will probably find this a very interesting point, is the fact that when it comes to the events, when federal and state laws conflict, the stricter of the two must be followed. Meaning, if New York State is more strict when it comes to the laws than the federal government, we follow New York State laws. If the federal government is more strict than the New York State law, will follow federal guidelines. So this is extremely key. When you're thinking in terms of the PTCA itself, you have to keep in mind, this is a national organization. So they are focusing on national regulations. So take yourself out, take the New York self out of your, take New York out of yourself when answering these questions and remember what the federal guidelines are. So that's why it's key to keep this in mind when it comes to this, protect, this section. Now, when it comes to DEA verification, DEA verifications, it's kind of like a Da Vinci code. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> Probably took me two to three days to understand this concept mm -hmm. because I was like, this is so obsolete because nowadays, us as pharmacy technicians and having technology, we generally know what this process is and how to verify DEA verification, but the, but the PTZ expects us to know this information. So when it comes to DEA numbers, they consist of two letters followed by seven numbers. The first letter identifies the type of DEA uh, registrant, and the second letter is the letter, first letter of the prescriber's last name. So to verify, follow the following steps when it comes to verifying a DEA. So you take all the odd numbers within the DEA. That's the first third, and fifth numbers together, which gives you some number one. Then take the second, fourth, and sixth numbers, which is the evens, and times it by two, which gives you some number two. You take some number one plus some number two, gives you the grand summation of the entire DEA number. The second digit of the grand sum is the same as the last digit of the prescriber's DEA number. I know, take a minute, process all that, because I'm sure you're like, Raphael, you've lost your damn mind. But <laughs> <laughs> the PTC wants us to know this information, so I have to put this in the review in terms of how to know how to verify a DEA verification. Granted, we could go online and search for this information, but if an online, ver an online reference isn't avail to us, available to us, we as healthcare professionals, as pharmacy professionals, need to know this information in order to determine whether or not a DEA number that's written on the prescription is real or is fake. So once again, this is kind of like the Da Vinci Code when it comes to our pharmacy practice, but I promise you one question, just one question, which can, can really bring you over the lines of passing this actual exam itself is gonna be based on DEA verification. So please, I sometimes concentrate on this slide. Now, the next thing we're gonna be talking about is the Food and Drug Administration. 
I promise you, ladies and gentlemen, we're about halfway through this and you'll have more interesting topics post me, I promise you. But talking, moving forward with our legal discussion, we have the Food and Drug Administration or the FDA. The FDA, yeah, the FDA or Food and Drug Administration is responsible for, uh, for regulating the safety and efficiency of drug devices and biologics. They're responsible for approval of all medications before it can be put on the market. Reg uh, they also regulate the manufacturing and labeling dispensing of and post-market surveillance when it comes to drugs hitting the market. So when it comes to the FDA, they do have certain regulations such as at black box warnings that are put on certain drugs. When it comes to black box warnings, these are warnings that aim to alert healthcare providers and consumers of serious potential adverse effects or life-threatening risks. An example of black box war black spot excuse me again tongue tied an example of black box warning drugs or opioid analgesics which contain a black box warning alerting the percent of the product's high risk of abuse misuse and medication in addition to the potential for life threatening respiratory depression. Another thing when it comes to FDA requirements. The pharmacy's labeling of controlled substances, and once again, talking about controlled substances again, because not just limited to DEA, but the FDA as well. When it comes to controlled substances, it must be compliant with the following federal regulations. On any type of drug that's being dispensed that happens to be a controlled substance, you must have the following on the pharmacy label. The fill date, pharmacy name and address, prescription number, patient name, prescription uh, prescribing practitioner, the drug strength, excuse me, drug name, strength, dosage form, quantity, a number of fills. Now keep in mind, alluding to our previous slide, number of fills, meaning refills, is only particularly when it comes to C3, C4s, never C2s, and directions for use of any applicable cautionary verbiage. Now, the FDA also requires that the following warning must be presented on the label. So, every single prescription drug should have the following auxiliary label placed in the actual bottle itself. And it reads, caution, federal law prohibits the transfer of the drug to any person other than the patient for whom it was prescribed. This is generally a giant uh, yellow and um, black labeled uh, auxiliary sticker that gets placed in every single type of controlled substance drug. So you'll definitely see that there. Now, when it comes to dispensing controlled substances, a prescription is only valid and can be dis dispensed if it is written for a legitimate medical purpose under the usual scope of practice of the prescribing practitioner. So meaning to say, you're not gonna see a doctor who is an allergist prescribing Oxycodone, 20, oh, excuse me, uh, per, oh, well, no, oxy, 20 milligrams for someone who has just sneezing or hay fever to a patient, any given patient that doesn't sound right. Like a red flag should like read up in your mind. Now, if it's a, a pain medicine doctor, that makes about sense. So it has to be for a uh, actual medical practitioner um, that is in its field to actually prescribe certain controlled medications. Medications must be legally dispensed by, to the patient or a member of their household. Mm -hmm. So for instance, a minor to their parents. So if it's a prescription for the minor, the parent is gonna come and pick it up. Now, if you're dispensing for your cousin's sisters, half brothers, twice removed, that is a little bit fishy. So you gotta keep that in mind when actually when the patient is receiving the drug. So there's a couple of regulations when it comes to that, in fact. Mm -hmm. There is no federal uh, quality, excuse me, there's no federal quantity limit on controlled prescriptions. And state law, depending on the jurisdiction, depending on the jurisdiction, typical limits C2 dispensing to a 30-day supply, or when it comes to C3 through C5s, to a 90-day supply. So keep that in mind, 30-day max when it comes to C2s, 90-day max when it comes to C3s or C5s. So that is essentially key. When it comes to reverse distribution, um, this is 
something that I actually had to recently uh, study up on. But reverse distribution, this occurs when a pharmacy sends out outdated, unusable drug product back to the drug manufacturer or other authorized distributor for dispensing or disposal. This is generally done on a DEA form 4-1. We spoke about DEA 222 previously. Now we're talking about DEA form 4-1. This also occurs when a drugs are returned by patients or the drugs are expired. The DEA for, uh, Form 41 is for outdated damage or unwanted controlled substances that may be destroyed under authorization of the DEA. This form is used to destroy the medications. The form must contain the following information, dates, locations, and method of destruction. The NDC name, drug, excuse me, name, strength, dosage form and quantity of the medications being destroyed must be listed as well. As signatures, uh, two witnesses of this destruction, so you, um, uh, generally this should be two employees, must be referenced at all times. Now this is when it comes to DEA forms 4v1. I'm gonna be talking about some other forms in the next upcoming slides. Excuse me for a moment. Next thing we're gonna be talking about is take back program. Take back programs are becoming um, very common, especially here in the state of New York. Um, but the take back program is a program to safely dispose of unwanted prescriptions, medications, regardless of being controlled or not controlled. This is not right. This is overseen by the federal government, but it's not regulated or required by any particular government, only on the local levels. New York State just recently moved to a take back program. Um, for certain health system pharmacies and also for the for locations such as New York City that have a high opioid use or abuse area. But for us in New York City in particular, or even those within the state of New York, there are some take back programs. They generally occur at, um, at local uh, police stations, universities, or some hospital systems. And beneficially, beneficial as unwanted are voluntarily donated and disposed of correctly. So for instance, there are certain family members that were taking care of a family that was in hospice care and they had a high amount of C2 medications. So them having these C2 medications in the home and not knowing what to do about it and they can't return it back to the farm, in order to dispose of it, they'll bring them back to the take back program in order for them to dispose of it safely. And so that way they're not sitting there passing it off to someone else. And it helps with public safety to ensure unwanted medications do not end up in the wrong hands, meaning the controlled medications that are being disposed of is not being used for street value or being sold on the street or the black market. And then in addition, keep in mind, they're not being disposed of in areas that could potentially harm the environment, such as waterways or airways. So they're not being exposed to our water supply, not being exposed to the air. So these are the pro this is why shake back programs are extremely vital in particular areas. When it comes to loss or theft, in the event of loss or theft, when it comes to C3 through C5 medications, the DEA and local law enforcement must be notified immediately. The pharmacist must fill out a DEA form 106. So just dropping some hints here, <laughs> talked about DEA 222. We've talked about DEA form, the, the previous DEA form um, 41. Now we're talking about DEA form 106. 106 form details what happens when there is a loss or theft. And the pharmacist must fill out the DEA form 106 that details the medications involved in the theft. The original form is sent to the DEA and a copy of that form is kept for the pharmacy and for pharmacy records. Only a significant loss of controlled substances required to DEA 106 forms is required to be submitted. Small quantities or liquid spills or broken tablets do not need to be reported. So for instance, if you're working in your outpatient pharmacy and two tablets spill on the floor, those two tablets can be wasted. Now, if you had 200 bottles of Percocet being lost or theft, those things significantly have to be reported. And generally speaking, your quality assurance department should be called in, but they need to be reported on a DEA form 106. 
So those are extremely key. So once again, we spoke about DEA Form 222, DEA Form 41, DEA Form 106. These are the three that you should definitely differentiate for your exam. Next thing we're gonna be talking about is RENS programs. I promise, ladies and gentlemen, please stay up with me throughout this process. Trust me, this is not my favorite subject either, but it is extremely key. Um, the next thing we're gonna be talking about is REMS programs, which is a risk evaluation and mitigation strategies or REMS is a, a drug safety program that the, F, um, that the FDA require or, uh, for certain medications with serious safety concerns to help ensure the benefits of the medications that out outweigh the risks. REMS programs are designated to reinforce medications use behaviors and actions that support the, uh, the safe use of the medications. Currently, there's over 61, they're not over, but there are 61 programs that have REMS programs. Some examples are listed below. But some of the common ones that we as technicians have probably have seen before in the past are clonazepam, isotrinitone, uh, um, any type of opioid analgesic, suboxone, thalidomide, or zeprexa are medications that we generally see that are part of REMS programs. So please keep this in mind. Mycophenolate is another one, especially when it comes to transplant patients. You'll see this very commonly, but just as the words to the wise, REMS programs are out there. Just keep this in the back of your mind when it comes to your studying. Next thing we're going to be talking about is pseudofedrin or restricted drug programs. Pseudofed, as we've probably seen in the past couple of years, back in 2005 in particular, way back when, when I was first practicing as a pharmacy technician, and yes, I am dating myself when it comes to this, uh, pseudofedrin is based on the Combat Met uh, Methamphetamine Epidemic Act of 20 2005, or the CMEA. Restrictions are placed in pseudofedrin meaning when it comes to the sale of pseudofedrin, the max amount that can be brought in is 3.6 grams per day and eight grams in a 30 day period based on the chemical, not the drug strength itself. In terms of storage, the medication must be kept behind the pharmacy counter to ensure compliance with documentation with the sale of the theft prevention. In terms of records, an electronic or written logbook must be kept detailing the personal information of the person who's purchasing the product. The quantity, yep. strength, and drug yep. of product sale or time of product sale. Next thing we're going to be talking about is drug recalls. When it comes to drug recalls, pharmacies must comply. And we're almost at the end, I promise you. Uh, when it comes to drug recalls, pharmacies must comply with all drug and product recalls and responsible for keeping accurate records to, de uh, to aid in the safety of patients that might have been affected various reasons for a drug or product is recalled. So particular reasons could be problems with the dosage or form or adverse reactions related to the specific medications. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later when it comes to different categories of drug recalls. Pharmacists need to contact all patients who might have been affected and reconcile the need for the recall. All recall records must be maintained similarly to prescriptions, so kept within your pharmacy system for at minimum two to five years. When it comes to recall classification, there are three major classes, class one, class two, and class three. When it comes to class one recalls, it's the most severe of recalls and involves medication that is likely to, adverse, to cause adverse effects or death. An example of such is one drug is labeled as another drug. So for instance, I receive a drug medication and I thought I was receiving Tylenol or Tylenol number three. And it just so happens to be oxycodone. Not the same thing, totally different clot, totally different, a completely different error. And this is not a good thing. Next thing we're gonna be doing, talking about is when it comes to class two. Class two drugs occurs when medications may cause temporary adverse health effects that are, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, if you can please place yourself on mute. I think there's somebody out there that doesn't know how to put themselves on mute. Yeah, I, I totally hear you on that one, Roberta. Um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, if you can please place yourselves on mute.
There we go. I think we're good. Or not. So, class two medications occurs when a medication may cause temporary adverse health effects that are irreversible or if there is a small risk of adverse effects. So for instance, one thing that recently just happened um, is going to be um, the Johnson & Johnson recall when it comes to all the medications, that, um, the, the vaccinations that we just recently have gone through. Um, because of the fact of a small demographic of um, patients that happen to have rec received um, blood clots um, to receiving the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, we placed it on the class two, um, the class well, two one recall. Second. Sorry, one sure. second. Thank you for that, Matt. I appreciate you. Okay. Ah, excellent. That definitely changes things up. <laughs> um, next class is class three. Uh, the least severe are not likely to cause a patient to have adverse effects. Example for this is 2017, where we saw a, a recall when it comes to glipizide ER tablet. Um, and the recall was due to the failed limits from water content during stability testing. Uh, when it comes to recall targets, recall targets vary um, based on the type of product that's out there on the market. So we have medications, devices, supplies, and supplements. When it comes to medication, recalls protect the public from the imperfect or potentially dangerous medications that are discovered after the medication reaches the U.S. market. Common reasons on why we recall these medications are for product contamination, product impurities, product mislabeling, and adverse effects. When it comes to devices, devices can become defective or health hazard, which would warrant a product recall. Common medical devices um, that are being recalled are, for instance, insulin pumps, glucose monitors, infusion pumps, glucose, glucose test strips, and cardiac pacemakers of all things. Next is gonna be supplies. Recalled by the FDA are voluntarily by medical supply manufacturers due to the uh, faulty components. Common medical supplies are generally needles, syringes, surgical gloves, and sterile saline. Net, last but not least, it's going to be supplements, which was talked about a little bit earlier this, this afternoon with my colleague Adrian, where, it's called, where certain supplements can be recalled from time to time due to various health reasons. For instance, contamination, presence of undeclared ingredients, super or sub uh, potency, Product, and lastly, product mislabeling. Now, keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, I bored you with some of the basic fundamentals when it comes to the federal law, but I encourage you to educate yourselves and bore yourselves because they work as a great sleep aid on top of having Ambien for the night or a glass of wine and or beer of choice when it comes to studying certain laws that the, D the PDCE will definitely require. Um, some laws include the law of 1938, which is the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Then in the 1970s, the Occupational Safety and Health Act, the Controlled Substances Act of 1970, and the Poison Prevention Ad Packaging Act of 1970. The 1990 Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act is something that could potentially be called, so I encourage you to read through and definitely familiarize yourselves with that. In 1996, the Health Insurance um, Portability and Accountability Act. And last but not least, I strongly encourage you to read up on the Combat Methamphetamine Ep um, Epidemic Act, which we briefly talked about in the previous slides back in 2005. So with that said, I provide you with my references. And I'd like to turn the floor over to our Patient Safety and Quality Insurance Group, um, both Dr. Jamie chan Hin and Michael McDonald, who are all, McDonough, who is also going to be talking about this product, which is a component of 26.25% of the actual exam itself. Jamie, Michael, you have the floor, and I thank you. Thank you so much, Raphael, and thank you for having us speak today. We're so excited. I'll start the presentation first, and then I'll turn it over to Michael after. And I just want to give a really quick shout out to you, Raphael. I think you're doing a great job and even explaining that DEA component. That was really exciting because 
I actually didn't remember how that was calculated to verify. Um, so next slide, please. So this is an overview slide about all the things that we'll be discussing and we'll go into them in detail more um, in the next slide. Next slide, please. So high alert and high risk medications. So the ISMP, the Institute for Safe Medical Practices, have identified high alert medications and medications that are likely to cause harm even when used at the um, intended doses that they are prescribed. They can cause patient suffering. We can see additional costs to health as well to, to um, counteract the harm that can be done. ISMP also has a list that has 19 categories. There are 14 specific medications that they uh, highlight that are harmful. And the goal of ISMP is to um, improve and identifying these medications to prevent further harm or further mistakes. Next slide, please. So these are the categories of medications that can cause harm, such as anticholinergics, um, oh, adrenal, sorry, yeah, adrenergic and agonist and antagonists, such as epinephrine and propanolol. There are some anesthetic agents that can help sedate patients when they're going on to procedures. There are some antiarrhythmic med medications that can help with um, cardiac arrhythmias, antithrombotic medications that are anticoagulants or antithrombotics, such as um, warfarin, which is an oral anticoagulant, Enoxaparin, which is the um, generic name for Luminox. There's heparin. There's rivaroxaban, an oral anticoagulant, Altaplace, and then some of the antiplatelet agents, such as like um, Clopidogrel. Then we also go into some chemotherapeutic agents, like Christine, Doxorubicin. We have some ionotropic agents. Um, insulin is a really big one as well, since there are so many different types of insulin. There's some sedatives that help set sedate patients while they're going under procedures and, and uh, a surgery. Opioids, like Raphael and some other people were mentioning too, opioids are highly um, risk for harm. There are some neuromuscular blocking agents that help with surgery and procedures as well. Oral antidiabetics, similar to insulin, there are so many types of oral antidiabetics and they can cause hypoglycemia. Some IV fluids as well, so both um, sodium chloride and also there's um, harm with or potential harm for. Uh, dextrose solutions. And then for solutions, we have T -T TPN and PPN for nutrition, as well as cardioplegic solutions and dialysis solutions. Next slide, please. Next, we're going to go into the specific medications. So specific medications include these in the table. I won't go through all of them. I'll let you guys review them. But these medications are highly um, different from the ones in the other classes or in the same class but have um, potential for harm for mixing up. Next slide, please. So in, in this class of medications, we have look like sound likes as well. So ISMP maintains a list and th these lists are usually posted in the pharmacy or shared through different um, ways like email or even just hanging out the poster. But these medications look similar to other medications and they're com they can be completely different and have different effects. So we, this list will show um, how we can identify and be more careful to show that there are different medications. And it, we also have check stops in place such as double verifications, two independent checks to prevent us from confusing medications that look like and sound like. Next slide, please. So for example, heparin, this is an anticoagulant to help thin the blood. It's commonly used pretty much on every patient who's in the hospital. And it, as you can see here, Heparin itself has so many different strengths. It ranges from 1,000 to 100,000, and these are the ones that just look similar. Um, I have a story about this. Our, there's an actor, Dennis Quaid. Him and his wife, Kimberly, had delivered twins, and they were they, the twins had received a dose of heparin, but the hospital didn't know that they received a 1,000-fold higher increased dose of heparin that they were intended to. So moments after they received the dose, they started bleeding through their injection site and it slowly progressed to bleeding through their eyes, bleeding through their nose, and no one really knew what was going on until they had to do a root cause analysis really quickly to find out what happened. And they found that, that the dose that was administered was from a vial that was much higher concentration than was intended to. So they had to rapidly find a way to reverse it. And luckily there is a reversal agent called protamine to reverse heparin. So they were given the dose of protamine and then the clotting effect was um, reversed. So they weren't, were given something that was a pro-coagulant to help them clot. So that's just one example of so many errors that have been made, but this one, of course, was an actor. 
So this caused a lot of awareness since um, the actor then shared his story with the world to medication errors such as this look like, sound like here. So ISMP has a list, which we'll go into next, about how to identify certain medications. And it actually gave the pharmaceutical companies more of a um, responsibility to make the packaging different. So that way they have responsibility to allow us to like differentiate between different strengths of the same medication. And even in the next slide, we'll see different medications that have similar labeling, such as here we have his example, heparin, there's so many different types of strengths of heparin. It can come in wild, it can come in as a compounded bag, a commercially available bag. And now this helps show that different colors will give us insight to, to different strengths. But even within the same color, we can see that heparin vial that's about orange to yellow could be 10,000 units or 30,000 units per ml. So this is definitely um, a big medication that has many strengths and potential for error. Next slide, please. And this is just another example. Those were IV or parenteral medications. Now we have oral medications. So for example, we, on the left, we have gabapentin, which is used for neuropathic pain, can be used for seizures and restless leg syndrome, next to gemfibrosil, which looks very similar in packaging. This helps lower cholesterol. And then we have ampicillin and amoxicillin. These are two antibiotics, but they have different spectrums of bacterial. So one bacteria ampicillin has more gram-positive coverage, whereas amoxicillin has less gram-positive coverage, but more gram-negative coverage for bacteria. And then the next one, hydralazine is used for, to lower blood pressure and can be used for heart failure, as well as hydroxazine can be used for itching and anxiety. So totally different indications, but very similar packaging and strengths. Next slide, please. So how do we prevent these errors? Well, one, minimize clutter in the pharmacy. I know that when we're so busy, we have so many on our counter to check and to pull. And one thing is to help train order to what we're pulling and checking. So when we, when we're finished checking a bottle or checking medications, we can put it in a bin to then be put back on the stock and um, clear it out. So we're not confusing with anything that comes up next. Also looking at medication rooms that are, can be on the nursing unit, looking for computer stations that may be cluttered with medications from the tube station, even especially, and then the IV room, the sterile compounding. Um, area that we don't want to mix up things there because once something's injected in the bag, we no longer know exactly what was there unless we have some robotic technology and barcode technology. There's also the readback method and to spell the names. This is really important because we also want to use generic names as much as possible to prevent us from saying things that might look like and sound like with the brand names. The use of barcode systems, this helps to scan for efficiency and safety. And it's also a double check for us where we're checking things. If we have it barcoded and scanned, we can then track the um, lifetime of that barcode scanning. Also want to be aware of, yeah, look like sound likes when we're working with medications. We also have labels. Um, if you ever know in the pharmacy, if you put on those like high alert medication labels, those white ones with the red um, font with that says high alert, that's usually why we, we're going by that list of medication that look like sound like. And so we stick those labels on to make sure we double check. And then having two independent reviewers, such as like a tech check, check, check program, or having the pharmacist check the technician and then having another pharmacist check that second, second pharmacist, that really helps to minimize errors. And then the th last thing is being proactive. So to, to, find, find, um, to try to find areas of unsafe practices and then tell someone about it. Like let's say if I'm compounding in the IV room and I find something that's unsafe, I want to bring it to my um, colleagues to then share this, and then we want to prevent errors from happening and promote change, of course. So it's all that quality improvement. Next slide, please. So what are the second part is issues that require pharmacy interventions. And what I thought about this was the five rights. So there, there's the right patient. We want to make sure that the medication is the right patient. When medicate, we want to make sure the medication is scheduled to the right time of the day. We want to make sure that it's the right dose, so the milligram or unit dose, whichever one that we are using, we want to make sure that the dose is right. Um, the right route administration, so if it's oral or subcutaneous or IV, and then of course the right medication, the right drug. So when I think of, if there are errors to any of these five things, that should be things that we should be catching and then the pharmacist can help um, fix those errors. We may have to consult the doctor to fix the order. Next slide, please. 
So reporting medication errors, this is something called um, just culture in a lot of hospitals and health system practices. We wanna make sure we report problems that we see so that way we can make changes and avoid having someone um, make these same errors again. So a big thing with that is documentation of errors. So you're preparing something for a pharmacist check and you see something's incorrect, I would let that pharmacist know or even let other people know to then make that aware for leadership to treat, create some process changes or just some more safety measures. So documentation is really important for improving medication dispensing processes. And then rep reporting medication errors to help identify system errors, and system failures to prevent future errors. That's gonna be really important. And we also call this, call this as root cause analysis. That's something we do um, when we find an error, especially in our system at NYU, we have something called PSI system. PSI, when before our hospital merged with NYU, we had something called winners, W-I-N-R-X. So wherever uh, or whichever system you have, it's really to utilize it. It does take some time to log in, usually to a system with your login information from the um, institution you're working in. But if there's a method to reporting errors that's convenient, um, I would definitely encourage you to do so because it's not used for a punitive effect. It's more a learning process. So that way we can make changes and prevent future errors. Next slide, please. So yes, reporting uh, medication errors, we have different systems. There's the medication error reporting system, such as the one I mentioned, um, our institution uses that PSI system, but then there's also several systems that are um, offered in different institutions. They're, they're operated by ISMP and USP. Consumer and healthcare providers may report potential or actual medication errors, and it's all confidential. So there, um, you shouldn't have any um, guilt of reporting something that you, that you see is wrong and should be fixed. So MedWatch. So MedWatch is more of a national reporting system where we report it to the FDA, and the FDA then looks at these problems. So at our local institution, we will report to our local in, uh, reporting system, and then the, those who are reviewing those errors will then report them to the FDA if they think they're severe enough. Um, there's Medmar X. This is a confidential medication reporting system as well. It shares strategies, prevention strategies with other health systems. So this is very powerful too. And then there's also the New York um, Patient Occurrence Reporting System. So this tracks the, the medication errors reported throughout New York State. Next slide, please. Thank you. And then I think this was just a snapshot of different medication errors. Oh, I'm sorry. Actually, this is where we switched off. Sorry, I have to change this, the speaker. So I think, Michael, are you? Are you Jamie, you're doing fine. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I took your slides. OK, I'm going to change. I'm going to switch the floor over to you. Thank you, everyone, for your time. All right, uh, yeah, this slide that looks like it didn't come through um, properly. Uh, can you go to the next slide, uh, Raphael? See if it came through on the next slide. Oh, no. All right, uh, so basically um, there's percentages of medication errors. Medication errors can occur anywhere in the med use process. Uh, think of the prescribing and transcribing part, which is the physician and uh, clinician area. The dispensing part, which is mostly pharmacy driven. For you folks that are in the hospitals as opposed to retail, um, hospital would certainly be more involved in other, all the processes as opposed to uh, outpatient or uh, retail, which would just be in the dispensing part. Uh, in addition, don't forget the administration part, which is, is normally nursing uh, in the hospital. Uh, again, all parts of the process uh, where medication errors can occur. So it's often what's known as multifactorial, in other words, a medication error can occur anywhere along uh, along the process of medication use process, it's called. Um, like Jamie had alluded to, um, if it happens to one person, it could happen to another. Uh, like she had said, with uh, um, errors in the, within the pharmacy, just to let other people know or to report it um, um, in other mechanisms. Uh, it's important to track and trend as well. In other words, if something is occurring with certain medications, you're having trouble with insulins all the time or with dosing insulins or with administering insulins, it's all important for tracking and trending uh, to work on process improvements for those things. Uh, Jamie again had mentioned the, the, the five rights. Uh, you may see seven rights 
as well in the literature. Uh, the, the seventh right uh, probably has to do with the nursing administration part. And um, very important now not to be overlooked is barcode scanning uh, for the right medication, uh, both when we dispense and when nursing administers. Um, so that's one to really keep in mind. Uh, next slide, please. All right, just some other stuff. Again, some of this was covered already. Uh, PPE, in addition to um, uh, hygiene and cleaning standards, uh, I think with COVID and with um, infection control, foremost on our minds for the last year and a half, obviously everybody's much more aware of this stuff now uh, than they were prior. Uh, again, it's still important, not just for COVID, but for all of our practices every day. Uh, compounding areas clean and sanitary before compounding. Um, probably best for most places to clean Q shift or after you're done with one product before going to the next product. Uh, again, pretty straightforward common sense rules here. Clean your workspace before and after. Remove jackets, sweaters, and jewelry. Uh, something that has recently come up on a lot of joint commission surveys is makeup. Uh, in the compounding areas, we should not be wearing makeup. Uh, washing hands and, and on arms with soap and water, again, for the right length of time, uh, and follow your, your pharmacy's cleaning and garden procedures. There may be surveillance being done, be it uh, direct observation or camera observation uh, by pharmacy personnel or by infection control personnel. There's a lot of videos probably within your health system and on certainly on YouTube for following proper techniques for uh, cleaning and garbing and donning and doffing. Next slide. Okay, again, um, just some terminology to know for best practice practices of donning and doffing. Again, you guys are very familiar with this now with COVID. Uh, if you work in the compounding area, you're somewhat involved in compounding area. You're very familiar with these things. Um, if you have limited time to study, Obviously the stuff that Raphael went over is probably something you need to spend more time on than this. Uh, but again, every count, every point does count. Um, you have to shoot for that 80%. So wherever you can get your points, it, it's, uh, I guess everything is important. Next slide. Okay, so, um... I just want to see if I can share this my screen. Sure, Sarah. I'm going to send this over mm -hmm. to you. One moment. Thank you so I'll much for joining us today. I'll try to make this as today. quick as and as painless as possible. I know we have like oh. ten minutes left. Oh, oh, honey, don't worry about it. I made this as torturous as possible for everybody else, so don't worry about it. <laughs> um, worst case scenario, I can always advance the screen for you. Just let me know if that works best for you. Um, hold on. Let's see. It says okay. That's fine. Okay. Okay, so um, I'm doing section four, order entry and processing. So I'm Sarah Amin. Uh, I'm a medication reconciliation pharmacist at Mercy Medical Center. Next slide. Okay, so uh, section four is approximately a quarter of the exam, 21.25%. And I'll go over non-sterile compounding as well as any calculations that are important for the exam. So in terms of non-sterile compounding, essentially it refers to any preparation that does not meet the standards for sterile compounding. So mixtures, ointments, liquids, emulsions, suppositories, and enemas. Next. So before uh, starting for any um, compounding medication, there's a general formula. You, the first one is create the formula. You get the prescription, what products do you need? How much of those products do you need? So you have to calculate how much you need. You, you don't want a situation where you're like, oh, I needed two bottles of this active ingredient and I don't have it, let me go get it. Now you've um, forgotten where you are. Did you add something? Did you not add this? So you need to have all of the, um, all of your ingredients in, in the first step. Then you wash your hands, you wear your PPE, and then obtain uh, hardware, su hardware supplies needed. A uh, graduated cylinder, any um, weighing um, balances, anything like that. Then you weigh your active ingredients, you combine them, document, and you label your product. Next. 
So in terms of a mixture, a mixture that's a blanket term, at least two substances, two to three substances, two liquids, a liquid and solid, two solids, just an active ingredient and an inactive ingredient. Um, an example would be a liquid mixture like magic mouthwash. You have lidocaine 2%, lidocaine and acid, and diphenhydramine in a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio. Next. Okay. So in this picture, we have an ointment. Uh, an ointment is a topical preparation. It's a water and oil mixture, whereas a cream is an oil and water mixture. So a water and oil mixture just means the oil is the base. Uh, it's more viscous. It's more like a, the base is like aquaphor or Vaseline, something very, very um, thick. So um, ointments and creams are mixed through spatulation, which you see in this picture here. And it's um, done using geometric dilution, which basically means there's small, small equal parts of each ingredient are mixed um, one at a time to get like a homogeneous uniform mixture. Then it's stored in a tube and jar or jar. Okay, so a liquid compound has uh, two components, a solute and a solvent. The solute is the active drug. It's uniformly dispersed throughout the solvent. solvent the solvent is the liquid component and that's used to administer the active drug. Okay. <clears throat> now emulsions, think salad dressing. If there's two liquids that are immiscible, they're not mixable, but there's a discontinuous phase and that's dispersed throughout continuous phase. So in salad dressing, you kind of see the little bubbles of oil dispersed within the dressing and then you shake it up and it becomes a uniform mixture. So that's an example of an emulsion. So uh, in terms of suppositories and enemas, suppositories are the solid formulation, either rectal or vaginal administration. The active medication is suspended in the base. So it's a solid once, it's, uh, once it goes internally, then the active base will melt and reach um, the, uh, the inside of the body. So this can be done through hand rolling, fusion molding, or compression molding. This shows compression molding. Enemas are also for rectal administration, but they're a solution formulation. <clears throat> so uh, these compounds are represented in percentage strengths, weight by weight percent, volume by volume percent, percent or weight by volume percent. So the important thing here is to know the units. Weight by weight is grams of ingredient over 100 grams of total product. Volume by volume is milliliters of ingredient over 100 milliliters of total product. And then weight by volume is grams of ingredient over 100 milliliters of total product. Okay, so this is going to be the easiest way to digest how to convert, met, do metric conversions. I use this in like like elementary school, I still use this. It's just so much easier than remember. Like when you're under pressure, you don't, you might not remember your conversions, conversions or something in the test. So the mnemonic is King Henry died by drinking chocolate milk. Each uh, letter represents either the prefix or the base unit. By is the base unit. Grams, liters, meters, whatever it is without the prefix. And then the other letters represent the prefixes that you would need. And it's in this order because it shows if the decimal place, is, uh, the decimal place moves to the right or the left. Um, next slide. So if you have 20 milligrams and you want to move this, you want to change this to um, grams, you're going to want to move it, move the decimal place to the right with each prefix. So you're going to get two centigrams. And then you're going to, if you want, you have to move it one more to 0.2 uh, dec decigrams, and then another one to 0.02 grams. So then the, it's, it's kind of an easier way to do 20 milligrams to, um, equals 0.02 grams. Next. <clears throat> okay. So the best way to illustrate this is through a question. What is the final weight by volume percentage strength? in 20 milligrams of active drug powder dissolved in 50 ml of liquid. So we already know that 20 milligrams is equal to 0 0.02 grams. Next slide. Okay, 
So if you, if you were using the conversion factor, it would be a thousand. Next. And then, so we know it's 0.02 grams over 50 mLs. How much of it is, how many grams is over a hundred? So that's the, the weight by volume percent is in that 100 ml. That's why we're using 100 ml. We cross multiply next, we get two equals 50 X, um, two divided by 50 next would be 0.04 grams in 100 ml, which will give you 0.04% of weight by volume. Okay, so ratios and proportions. Ratio is just a relative value between two numbers. Um, we sh we show, saw in the magic mouthwash, it's one to one to one, right? So the relationship of one part to the next. A proportion is, um, it expresses the equality of both ratios. And that these are helpful when you're doing a lot of these math equations to get the, um, to get the uh, general idea. Okay, so dimensional analysis. Dimensional analysis is the same as factor label method. And I have the formula here, but you, you don't need to know the formula if you understand the major concept behind this. It converts the units of measure via a conversion factor. The conversion factor, it just shows the relationship between two numbers. Um, like one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters, 2.2 pounds equals one kg. Uh, that's, that's basically what a conversion factor is. Okay. Next, okay, perfect one. Okay, so how many centimeters are in six inches? Uh, I have the formula here and I have the conversion factor here. One inch equals 2.54 centimeters. Next. Okay, so if you don't know the formula, if you know just the concept, um, use the units. The units given are inches over the units wanted divided by the units given. So I'm just, right now it's just units, no numbers. I'm not plugging in any numbers yet. Next slide. So then when I plug in the numbers, the key point is to make sure that your conversion factor is in the right order. Because if it's six times 2.5, or divided, um, or if it's six divided by 2.54, you're gonna get two different answers. So you, you just have to make sure that these units, um, these units cancel each other out. Another thing to kind of look for, like the big picture is, if it's, if it's, if it's asking how many centimeters are in six inches, you know that there's centimeters are larger than like inches. So you know the number has to be greater than six. So in, when you get your choices, you know that you're gonna have to choose something that's greater than the number that's already represented. Next. So one way to illustrate the um, location of the conversion factor is I put a one under the six because it's a whole number. So you kind of know the numerator and the denominator. So you can see what's on top and what's on bottom. So you can see what cancels each other out. Here in this formula, the inches cancel each other out and you're left with um, just this, you're, you're left with the unit that you want, centimeters. Uh, so, it's just, so the answer would be six times 2.54 centimeters, which would be 15.24. Next. Okay, so these are some of the common conversion factors that you would need to know. Um, you guys can review this at a later time. And the next uh, calculation method would be the allegation method. This is a, looks intimidating, but once you kind of understand the concept again, then you'll be like, okay, this is, um, you, can get, you can get through it. So basically it just calculates the proportion of two different solution, two solutions of different concentrations to produce a third solution of a desired concentration. So you have the tic-tac-toe board, the higher concentrations on the upper left-hand corner, the lower concentrations on the bottom left-hand corner, and then you have the desired product strength in the middle. Now the top right-hand corner, next slide, is L minus, is P minus L, and then the bottom, next slide, is um, H minus P. Next slide. 
Okay, so it, it is confusing. So the best way is with um, a math problem. How would you make 700 milliliters of a 30% solution if you have a 60% solution and a 25% solution? Next. So we have the tic-tac-toe board. Next. And we're just gonna plug in the numbers. P equals 30. So we put it in the middle, then we put 60, and then we're gonna put the lower concentration on the bottom. Then we're gonna do 30 minus 25, which will give you the five, and then 60 minus 30, which will give you the 30. So that's how you put in all those numbers. Now, what do you do with them? So what does five represent? Five, the top number represents the number of parts of the higher solution. So that would be five parts of the 60% solution because that's uh, it's the whole line on the top. Same thing on the bottom. The bottom number is 30 parts of 25% solution. So now you know that 60% is five parts, 25% is 30 parts. Next. So, uh, if, so five parts is 60%, 30 parts is 25%, next. Okay, so then in order to get the solution, you need to know what are the total parts. The, you add both of those parts together, 30 plus five, that would equal 35. Then you have to figure out, okay, how, what do I do with that 35? You're gonna divide the final, constant, the final um, number, uh, the final amount of the product by the total amount of parts. So if that problem said 1000 ml of 30% solution, that number would be 1000. Right now it's 700 because that's what the problem said, 700 divided by 35 parts. So that would be 20 ml per part. Now, so now that we have 20, per, uh, 20 mLs per part, we're gonna add them back to uh, each component. So we had five parts of the 60%. So we'll do 20 mLs per part times five part, parts equals 100 mLs. And then 20 mLs per part of the 25% solution times 30 parts equals 600 mLs. Next, almost done guys. Okay, so 25%, you have 600 mLs going into the solution and you have 100 mLs of the 60% solution, giving you a total of 700 mLs of the 30% solution. Next, okay. So um, when you're reading a prescription, th that's all the math I have, don't worry guys. Okay, so when you're reading a prescription, these are some of the SIG codes that you'll see, QD, QOD, QOW. Um, in the hospital setting, some of these uh, codes are not allowed anymore due to increase of medication errors. Uh, QID, we don't really use it, but I work in the ER, so I'm, I'm transitioning from the, uh, from the outpatient setting to the inpatient setting, and oftentimes I do see this from outpatient things that don't have the same regulations as hospitals have. Now, one of the state codes I have Q4H every four hours, the, that number is interchangeable. It could be Q2H, Q2 every two hours, or Q12H every 12 hours. Um, now, these are the routes of administration uh, that you can go over at a later time. And some Roman numerals. Uh, Roman numerals are, I think the only one you probably might be unfamiliar with would be SS, which is a half. But basically, it's Roman numerals can be, uh, the, if, they're, if the numbers are repeated, then uh, you add the numbers together, but they can't be repeated more than three times. Um, v is the Roman numeral that cannot be repeated at all because if you have two Vs, that's 10, you already have a number for 10. Uh, if there's a larger number followed by a smaller number, you add those numbers. And if uh, you have a smaller number followed by a larger number, then you subtract those numbers. Next. And then abbreviations, uh, which you guys can go over um, on your own time. Thanks. That's it. I told you I made it super fast. Sarah, thank you so much for actually talking about this topic. I thought I had it rough with talking about law, which is the most boring thing on the planet. 26 gauge needles to the eye sometimes, but you rock this when it comes to math. Thank you so much. Thanks.
Um, okay, next component is drug administration with Matt. Matt, if you can please take the floor. Hi, I'm Matt Goldstein. I'm from, I'm a staff pharmacist at LRJ Valley Stream. Uh, next slide, please. So this is an oral syringe. Cannot attach a needle to it, cannot be used for any type of injection. Next, please. Injectable syringes used for any type of injection or vaccine or any uh, parenteral IV compound cannot, with, even without a needle, cannot be used for any oral use. Uh, next slide. These are examples of how various capsules or tablets can be packaged. Uh, generally, hospitals prefer everything to be unit dosed. Uh, next slide, please. Respiratory spacers are used with inhalers. Sometimes they're preferred. It uh, increases the effectiveness of the drug and the absorption of the drug. It, break, it gives more the drug more time to be broken down into particles. Next, please. Uh, these are examples of various diabetes supplies. Uh, probably more familiar for those of you in outpatient settings. Um, in hospital, we really don't see them or work with them that often. Uh, next, please. Okay. It's gonna be a little boring, but get through it. Uh, next slide, please. So this is an example of a label on a prescription bottle where it says batch, and there's no number there, but that would be an example of a lot number, which is assigned by the manufacturer in case for some reason there's a recall um, on the drug, it can be identified by that lot number, uh, expiration date of the drug, which isn't on there either, uh, is how long the drug is stable for. Drugs cannot be dispensed past the expiration date. If you repack a drug though, the expiration date will change. I'll get into that later. Uh, next slide, please. Hey, I just basically went over that. Uh, next slide, please. Went over that. Next slide, please. Okay. So the drug expiration date, as I was saying, in a hospital, we tend to repack uh, any capsules or tablets that come in a bottle in bulk. So most of the time, the computer will change or will calculate the new expiration date, but there is a formula for it. It's half the expiration date from the manufacturer or six months from the data repack, whichever is less. Uh, next slide, please. So if you have a repack date of May 31st, 2021, and the expiration date on the bottle is March 2022, the repack date would be five months or October 2021, because that is, let's say five, three, eight, ten, about 10 months total, which is divided by half would be five, so that's why it's five months and not six months. Okay. NDC numbers are used to identify the manufacturer of the product code that's assigned and the package size. They're usually 10 or 11 digits. These are various examples of the same NDC number in different formats, 10 digit, 11 digit. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so medications either from 
the floor, if you work in a hospital, from a patient, or if you yourself are returning something to a wholesaler. Uh, anything that's unopened and is in good dating can be redispensed or is known as a dispensable, can be returned for credit, it can, or can be returned to the pharmacy to be used again. Uh, indispensable medications examples are open bottles. Those can't be returned because they can't be used again. Next slide, please. So various reasons you might return a medication. A pharmacy might return a medication is uh, short expiration dates where you know you're not gonna use it. Uh, inventory control, maybe you ordered too much and you don't need it all. Ordering errors where you meant to order something else. And the, you will receive credit on them, but there's generally a restocking fee. Uh, next slide, please. Reverse distribution. So Raphael Touch was going over this before. But in the hospital, we use an outside company that comes and they take our expired meds and they go through the controlled drugs and they count them and they give us a form that we send to a company that destroys them. And all the meds are non-dispensable in, re in reverse distribution. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry, quick uh, problem with uh, the Wi-Fi here. One moment. <laughs> A matter of fact, Matt, that is the last of the slides. Is it? Yep. Oh, okay. I thought I had more. That was the last slide. Okay. Never mind. So that's basically oh. all I had. Um, it's not too complicated. It's more just tedious stuff, which somewhat intense. But that's basically my topics in a condensed version. No, it's perfect. Thank you so much, Matt, for contributing to this. Um, and thank you all, everybody, for uh, signing up with us tonight and actually joining us for tonight's review session. Um, there's a couple of quick shout outs that I want to give to a lot of people now that I have everybody on the ball right now. Um, this is a momentous night because it's not just one organization, as I alluded to before, but multiple organizations that kind of came together to, to create this programming for tonight. So not only our New York City chapter, but Long Island chapter, West chapter, Westchester chapter, and chapters from um, organizations from upstate and the state abroad have participated in tonight's event. In addition to that, for those of you, and I'm speaking as a pharmacy technician, um, I strongly encourage you to study your hardest for the PTCE. Think very logically in terms of how exactly to approach this exam. Have open conversations with your organization to find out when and where you should be, when and how you should be taking your PPCE. Meaning certain organizations have required uh, a, star, a hard start and a hard stop on when exactly you should take your PPCE. Sometimes it may be a deadline as early as January to complete your PPCE um, beforehand or even sooner. So have these open conversations, have these dialogues with your organization. So that way you are very clearly prepared um, for, for when to schedule out your PPCE. Now, please keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, the programming for tonight has been specific to the PTCE, the Pharmacy Technician Certification Exam. Keep in mind, there is a secondary option for you, the NHA, the National Health System Association, which you should certainly do some research on as a backup op option if you take the, uh, a different type of national certification exam. We have been focusing on the PTCE for tonight. Now, like I said before, 
Uh, this program was brought to you by multiple organizations that clear the board across the state of New York. But I want to give some special thought, a shout out, especially, especially to Adrian Chapman. Adrian, who happens to be a pharmacy technician that's worked with me on the new NYC SHP's Pharmacy Technician Executive Committee. I strongly encourage you for the pharmacy technicians that are on the call right now to engage. Um, I want to give a shout out to Sarah, to Matt, to Michael, to Jamie, to, uh, to the other Matt, who happens to be my director at large, and other members who have actually contributed to this, as well as NYSHP, um, who is also powered behind this program. So with that said, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We truly appreciate this. We'll definitely be um, posting this information at a later date. We do strongly encourage you to engage any chapter that is in your local area or your area of practice. And particularly, like I said, NYC, NY, uh, Long Island, Westchester, or state abroad, please we encourage you as pharmacy technicians to engage us. You have a seat at the table with us and we encourage you to take your PTCE path and join us. Um, please also understand the registration requirements when actually taking your PPCE. After we finish taking your PPCE, that if you work for our health system pharmacy department, you will be required to actually license and register with the New York State Board of Education, which will require you to have your high school diploma or your high school equivalency, meaning you have to provide proof of that. At least if you don't have either one of those two, you can also have at least a minimum of 30 credits of an undergraduate course that you can provide your transcript to in order to receive licensing um, through the state. So with that said, I want to close tonight's program out. I want to say thank you again to all the all our lecturers for tonight. Sarah, Matt, Jamie, Matthew, yeah, Michael, Adrian, we thank you. Have a great night. Happy studying. Be strategic and honest to God best of luck when it comes to your exam. Have a great night, everyone, and I hope you have a great experience taking, taking the PPC, and I look forward to you all being certified. Good night.